4. The nature of the atonement. The doctrine of the atonement here presented is the penal substitutionary or satisfaction doctrine, which is the doctrine clearly taught by the Word of God. A. Statement of the penal substitutionary doctrine of the atonement. In the discussion of this view several particulars should be stressed. 1. The atonement is objective. This means that the atonement makes its primary impression on the person to whom it is made. If a man does wrong and renders satisfaction, this satisfaction is intended to influence the person wronged and not the offending party. In the case under consideration it means that the atonement was intended to propitiate God and to reconcile him to the sinner. This is undoubtedly the primary idea, but does not imply that we cannot also speak of the sinners being reconciled to God. Scripture does this in more than one place, Romans 5 verse 10, 2 Cor 5 colon 19, 20. But it should be borne in mind that this is not equivalent to saying that the sinner is atoned, which would mean that God made amends or reparation, that he rendered satisfaction to the sinner. And even when we speak of the sinner as being reconciled, this must be understood as something that is secondary. The reconciled God justifies the sinner who accepts the reconciliation, and so operates in his heart by the Holy Spirit. That the sinner also lays aside his wicked alienation from God, and thus enters into the fruits of the perfect atonement of Christ. In other words, the fact that Christ reconciles God to the sinner results in a reflex action on the sinner, in virtue of which the sinner may be said to be reconciled to God. Since the objective atonement by Christ is an accomplished fact, and it is now the duty of the ambassadors of Christ to induce sinners to accept the atonement and to terminate their hostility to God, it is no wonder that the secondary and subjective side of the reconciliation is somewhat prominent in Scripture. This statement of the objective character of the atonement is placed in the foreground, because it represents the main difference between those who accept the satisfaction doctrine of the atonement, and all those who prefer some other theory. Now the question arises, whether this conception of the atonement is supported by Scripture. It would seem to find ample support there. The following particulars should be noted. a. The fundamental character of the priesthood clearly points in that direction. While the prophets represented God among men, the priests in their sacrificial and intercessory work represented men in the presence of God, and therefore looked in a Godward direction. The writer of Hebrews expresses it thus, For every high priest, taken from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. 5 colon 1. This statement contains the following elements, 1, the priest is taken from among men, is one of the human race, so as to be able to represent men, 2, he is appointed for men, that is, to be active in the interests of men, and, 3, he is appointed to represent men in things pertaining to God, that is, in things that have a Godward direction, that look to God, that terminate on God. This is a clear indication of the fact that the work of the priest looks primarily to God. It does not exclude the idea that the priestly work also has a reflex influence. On men. b. The same truth is conveyed by the general idea of the sacrifices. These clearly have an objective reference. Even among the Gentiles they are brought, not to men, but to God. They were supposed to produce an effect on God. The scriptural idea of sacrifice does not differ from this in its objective reference. The sacrifices of the Old Testament were brought to God primarily to atone for sin, but also as expressions of devotion and gratitude. Hence the blood had to be brought into the very presence of God. The writer of Hebrews says that the things pertaining to God consist in offering both gifts and sacrifices for sin. The friends of Job were urged to bring sacrifices, lest I, says the Lord, deal with you after your folly. Job 42:8 the sacrifices were to be instrumental in stilling the anger of the Lord. C. The Hebrew word kippah, peel, expresses the idea of atonement for sin by the covering of sin or of the sinner. The blood of the sacrifice is interposed between God and the sinner, and in view of it the wrath of God is turned aside. It has the effect, therefore, of warding off the wrath of God from the sinner. In the Septuagint and in the New Testament the terms helaskami and helasmos are used in a related sense. The verb means, to render propitious, and the noun, an appeasing, or, the means of appeasing. They are terms of an objective character. In classical Greek, they are often construed with the accusative of theos, God, though there is no example of this in the Bible. In the New Testament, they are construed with the accusative of the thing, Hamashas, Hebrews 2 verse 17, 
or with Piri and the genitive of the thing, Hamartian, 1 John 2 verse 2, for 10. The first passage is best interpreted in the light of the use of the Hebrew kippah, the last can be interpreted similarly, or with Theon as the object understood. There are so many passages of Scripture which speak of the wrath of God and of God as being angry with sinners, that we are perfectly justified in speaking of a propitiation of God, Romans 1 verse 18, Galatians 3 verse 10, Ephesians 2 verse 3, Romans 5 verse 9. In Romans 5 verse 10 and 11 28 sinners are called enemies of God, ekthroi, in a passive sense, indicating, not that they are hostile to God, but that they are the objects of God's holy displeasure. In the former passage this sense is demanded by its connection with the previous verse, and in the latter by the fact that ekthroi is contrasted with agapatoi, which does not mean lovers of God, but beloved of God. d. The words katalasso and katalage signify, to reconcile, and reconciliation. They point to an action by which enmity is changed to friendship, and surely have, first of all, an objective signification. The offender reconciles, not himself, but the person whom he has offended. This is clearly brought out in Matt, 5 23, 24, Therefore if thou bring thy gift before the altar, and there remember that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave thy gift there before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, which in this connection can only mean, reconcile thy brother to thyself, which is objective, and then come and offer thy gift. The brother who had done the supposed injury is called upon to remove the grievance. He must propitiate or reconcile his brother to himself by whatsoever compensation may be required. In connection with the work of Christ the words under consideration in some instances certainly denote the effecting of a change in the judicial relation between God and the sinner by removing the judicial claim. According to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, the fact that God reconciled the world to himself is evident from this that he does not reckon unto them their sins. This does not point to any moral change in man, but to the fact that the demands of the law are met, and that God is satisfied. In Romans 5 verses 10 and 11 the term, reconciliation, can only be understood in an objective sense, for, 1. It is said to have been affected by the death of Christ, while subjective reconciliation is the result of the work of the Spirit, too, it was effected while we were yet enemies, that is, were still objects of God's wrath, and, three, it is represented in verse 11 as something objective which we receive. e. The terms lutron and antilutron are also objective terms. Christ is the Goel, the Liberator, Acts 20 verse 28, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, 7 23. He redeems sinners from the demands of God's retributive justice. The price is paid to God by Christ as the representative of the sinner. Clearly, the Bible abundantly justifies us in ascribing an objective character to the atonement. Moreover, strictly speaking, atonement in the proper sense of the word is always objective. There is no such thing as subjective atonement. In atonement it is always the party that has done wrong that makes amends to the one who was wronged. 2. It is a vicarious atonement. a. The meaning of the term, vicarious atonement. There is a difference between personal and vicarious atonement. We are interested particularly in the difference between the two in connection with the atonement of Christ. When man fell away from God, he as such owed God reparation. But he could atone for his sin only by suffering eternally the penalty affixed to transgression. This is what God might have required in strict justice, and would have required, if he had not been actuated by love and compassion for the sinner. As a matter of fact, however, God appointed a vicar in Jesus Christ to take man's place, and this vicar atoned for sin and obtained an eternal redemption for man. Dr. Shedd calls attention to the following points of difference in this case, 1. Personal atonement is provided by the offending party, vicarious atonement by the offended party. 2. Personal atonement would have excluded the element of mercy, vicarious atonement represents the highest form of mercy. 3. Personal atonement would have been forever in the making and hence could not result in redemption, vicarious atonement leads to reconciliation and life everlasting. b. The possibility of vicarious atonement. All those who advocate a subjective theory of the atonement raise a formidable objection to the idea of vicarious atonement. They consider it unthinkable that a just God should transfer his wrath against moral offenders to a perfectly innocent party, and should treat the innocent judicially as if he were guilty. There is undoubtedly a real difficulty here, especially in view of the fact that this seems to be contrary to all human analogy.
we cannot conclude from the possibility of the transfer of a pecuniary debt to that of the transfer of a penal debt. If some beneficent person offers to pay the pecuniary debt of another, the payment must be accepted, and the debtor is ipso facto freed from all obligation. But this is not the case when someone offers to atone vicariously for the transgression of another. To be legal, this must be expressly permitted and authorized by the lawgiver. In reference to the law, this is called relaxation, and in relation to the sinner it is known as remission. The judge need not, but can permit this, yet he can permit it only under certain conditions, as, 1, that the guilty party himself is not in a position to bear the penalty through to the end, so that a righteous relation results, 2, that the transfer does not encroach upon the rights and privileges of innocent third parties, nor cause them to suffer hardships and privations, 3, that the person enduring the penalty is not himself already indebted to justice, and does not owe all his services to the government, and, 4, that the guilty party retains the consciousness of his guilt and of the fact that the substitute is suffering for him. In view of all this it will be understood that the transfer of penal debt is well nigh, if not entirely, impossible among men. But in the case of Christ, which is altogether unique, because in it a situation obtained which has no parallel, all the conditions named were met. There was no injustice of any kind. See, scriptural proof for the vicarious atonement of Christ. The Bible certainly teaches that the sufferings and death of Christ were vicarious, and vicarious. In the strict sense of the word that he took the place of sinners, and that their guilt was imputed, and their punishment transferred, to him. This is not at all what Bushnell means, when he speaks of the, vicarious sacrifice, of Christ. For him it simply means that Christ bore our sins, on his feeling, became inserted into their bad lot by his sympathy as a friend yielded up himself and his life, even, to an effort of restoring mercy, in a word that he bore our sins in just the same sense as he bore our sicknesses. Vicarious Sacrifice, page 46. The sufferings of Christ were not just the sympathetic sufferings of a friend, but the substitutionary sufferings of the Lamb of God for the sin of the world. The scriptural proofs for this may be classified as follows. 1. The Old Testament teaches us to regard the sacrifices that were brought upon the altar as vicarious. When the Israelite brought a sacrifice to the Lord, he had to lay his hand on the head of the sacrifice and confess his sin. This action symbolized the transfer of sin to the offering, and rendered it fit to atone for the sin of the offerer. Leviticus 1 verse 4. Cave and others regard this action merely as a symbol of dedication, the scriptural doctrine of sacrifice, pp 129f. But this does not explain how the laying on of hands made the sacrifice fit to make atonement for sin. Neither is it in harmony with what we are taught respecting the significance of the laying on of hands in the case of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16 verses 20-22. After the laying on of hands death was vicariously inflicted on the sacrifice. The significance of this is clearly indicated in the classical passage that is found in Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. Says Dr. Vose, the sacrificial animal in its death takes the place of the death due to the offerer. It is forfeit for forfeit. The sacrifices so brought were prefigurations of the one great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 2. There are several passages in Scripture which speak of our sins as being laid upon Christ, and of his bearing sin or iniquity, Isaiah 53 verses 6 and 12, John 1 29, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Galatians 3 verse 13, Hebrews 9 verse 28, 1 Peter 2 verse 24. On the basis of Scripture we can, therefore, say that our sins are imputed to Christ. This does not mean that our sinfulness was transferred to him, something that is in itself utterly impossible, but that the guilt of our sin was imputed to him. Says Dr. A. A. Hodge, sin may be considered, 1, in its formal nature as transgression of the law, 1 John 3 verse 4, or, 2, as a moral quality inherent in the agent, macula, Romans 6 verses 11 to 13, or, 3, in respect to its legal obligation to punishment, reatus. In this last sense alone is it ever said that the sin of one is laid upon or borne by another. Outlines of Theology, page 408. Strictly speaking, then, the guilt of sin as liability to punishment was imputed to Christ, and this could be transferred, because it did not inhere in the person of the sinner, but was something objective. 
3. Finally, there are several passages in which the prepositions peri, hupper, and anti are used in connection with the work of Christ for sinners. The substitutionary idea is expressed least by the first, and most by the last preposition. But even in the interpretation of hupper and anti we shall have to depend largely on the context, for while the former really means, in behalf of, it may, and in some cases does, express the idea of substitution, and while the latter may mean, instead of, it does not always have that meaning. It is rather interesting to notice that, according to Deisman, several instances have been found on the inscriptions of the use of Hupper with the meaning, as representative of. Light from the ancient East, p. 153, we find a similar use of it in Philemon 13. In such passages as Rom. 5 colon 6-8, 832, Galatians 2 verse 20, Hebrews 2 verse 9 it probably means, instead of, though it can also be rendered, in behalf of, but in Galatians 2 verse 13, John 11 verse 50, and 2 Cor. 5.15 it certainly means, instead of. Robertson says that only violence to the text can get rid of that meaning here. The preposition anti clearly means, instead of, in Matt, 222, 538, 2028, Mark 10 verse 45. According to Robertson any other meaning of the term is out of the question here. The same idea is expressed in 1 Timothy 2 verse 6. d. Objections to the idea of a vicarious atonement. Several objections are raised against the idea of vicarious atonement. 1. Substitution in penal matters is illegal. It is generally admitted that in cases of a pecuniary debt payment by a substitute is not only permissible, but must be accepted and at once cancels all further obligation on the part of the original debtor. However, it is said that penal debt is so personal that it does not admit of any such transfer. But it is quite evident that there are other than pecuniary cases in which the law has made provision for substitution. Armour in his work on atonement and law mentions three kinds of such cases. The first is that of substitution in cases of work for the public benefit required by law, and the second, that of substitution in the case of military service required in behalf of one's country. Respecting the third he says, even in the case of crime, law, as understood and administered by men in all lands, provides that the penalty may be met by a substitute, in all cases in which the penalty prescribed is such that a substitute may meet it consistently with the obligations he is, already under. Page 129. It is perfectly evident that the law does recognize the principle of substitution, though it may not be easy to cite instances in which innocent persons were permitted to act as substitutes for criminals and to bear the penalties imposed on these. This finds a sufficient explanation in the fact that it is usually impossible to find men who meet all the requirements stated under, b, above. But the fact that it is impossible to find men who meet these requirements, is no proof that Jesus Christ could not meet them. In fact, he could and did, and was therefore an acceptable substitute. 2. The innocent is made to suffer for the wicked. It is perfectly true that, according to the penal substitutionary doctrine of the atonement Christ suffered as, the righteous for the unrighteous, 1 Peter 3 verse 18, but this can hardly be urged as an objection to the doctrine of vicarious atonement. In the form in which it is often stated it certainly has very little force. To say that this doctrine makes the innocent suffer the consequences of the guilt of the wicked, and is therefore unacceptable, is tantamount to raising an objection against the moral government of God in general. In actual life the innocent often suffer as a result of the transgression of others. Moreover, in this form the objection would hold against all the so-called theories of the atonement, for they all represent the sufferings of Christ as being in some sense the result of the sins of mankind. Sometimes it is said that a moral agent cannot become reasonably responsible for any sin, except by doing it. Personally, but this is contradicted by the facts of life. One who hires another to commit a crime is held responsible, so are all accessories to a crime. 3. God the Father is made guilty of injustice. It appears that all the objections are really variations on the same theme. The third is virtually the same as the second put in a more legal form. The doctrine of vicarious atonement, it is said, involves an injustice on the part of the Father in that he simply sacrifices the Son for the sins of mankind. This objection was already raised by Abe Lard, but loses sight of several pertinent facts. It was not the Father, but the Triune God, that conceived the plan of redemption.
there was a solemn agreement between the three persons in the Godhead. And in this plan the Son voluntarily undertook to bear the penalty for sin and to satisfy the demands of the divine law. And not only that, but the sacrificial work of Christ also brought immense gain and glory to Christ as mediator. It meant for him a numerous seed, loving worship, and a glorious kingdom. And, finally, this objection acts as a boomerang, for it returns with vengeance on the head of all those who, like Abe Lard, deny the necessity of an objective atonement, for they are all agreed that the Father sent the Son into the world for bitter suffering and a shameful death which, while beneficial, was yet unnecessary. This would have been cruel indeed. For, there is no such union as would justify a vicarious atonement. It is said that, if a vicar is to remove the guilt of an offender, there must be some real union between them which would justify such a procedure. It may be admitted that there must be some antecedent union between a vicar and those whom he represents, but the idea that this must be an organic union, such as the objectors really have in mind, cannot be granted. As a matter of fact the required union should be legal rather than organic, and provision was made for such a union in the plan of redemption. In the depths of eternity the mediator of the new covenant freely undertook to be the representative of his people, that is, of those whom the Father gave unto him. A federal relationship was established in virtue of which he became their surety. This is the basic and the most fundamental union between Christ and his own, and on the basis of this a mystical union was formed. Ideally in the Council of Peace, to be realized in the course of history in the organic union of Christ and his Church. Therefore Christ could act as the legal representative of his own, and being mystically one with them, can also convey to them the blessings of salvation. 3. IT includes Christ's active and passive obedience. It is customary to distinguish between the active and passive obedience of Christ. But in discriminating between the two, it should be distinctly understood that they cannot be separated. The two accompany each other at every point in the Saviour's life. There is a constant interpenetration of the two. It was part of Christ's active obedience that he subjected himself voluntarily to sufferings and death. He himself says, No man taketh my life from me, I lay it down of myself, John 10 verse 18. On the other hand it was also part of Christ's passive obedience, that he lived in subjection to the law. His moving about in the form of a servant constituted an important element of his sufferings. Christ's active and passive obedience should be regarded as complementary parts of an organic whole. In discussing it, account should be taken of a threefold relation in which Christ stood to the law, namely, the natural, the federal, and the penal relation. Man proved a failure in each one of these. He did not keep the law in its natural and federal aspects, and is not now in a position to pay the penalty, in order to be restored in the favor of God. While Christ naturally entered the first relation by his incarnation, he vicariously entered only the second and third relations. And it is with these that we are particularly concerned in this connection a. The active obedience of Christ. Christ as mediator entered the federal relation in which Adam stood in the state of integrity, in order to merit eternal life for the sinner. This constitutes the active obedience of Christ, consisting in all that Christ did to observe the law in its federal aspect, as the condition for obtaining eternal life. The active obedience of Christ was necessary to make his passive obedience acceptable with God, that is, to make it an object of God's good pleasure. It is only on account of it that God's I estimate of the sufferings of Christ differs from his estimate of the sufferings of the lost. Moreover, if Christ had not rendered active obedience, the human nature of Christ itself would have fallen short of the just demands of God, and he would not have been able to atone for others. And, finally, if Christ had suffered only the penalty imposed on man, those who shared in the fruits of his work would have been left exactly where Adam was before he fell. Christ merits more for sinners than the Forgiveness of sins. According to Galatians 4 verses 4 and 5 they are through Christ set free. From the law as the condition of life, are adopted to be sons of God, and as sons are also heirs of eternal life. Galatians 4 verse 7. All this is conditioned primarily on the active obedience of Christ. Through Christ the righteousness of faith is substituted for the righteousness of the law. Romans 10 verses 3 and 4. Paul tells us that by the work of Christ, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, Romans 8 verses 3 and 4, and that we are made, the righteousness of God in him, 2 Cor 5 21. 
according to Anselm Christ's life of obedience had no redemptive significance, since he owed this to God for himself. Only the sufferings of the Saviour constituted a claim on God and were basic to the sinner's redemption. Thinking along somewhat similar lines Piscator, the 17th century Arminians, Richard Watson, R. N. Davies, and other Armenian scholars deny that the active obedience of Christ has the redemptive significance which we ascribe to it. Their denial rests especially on two considerations, one, Christ needed his active obedience for himself as man. Being under the law, he was in duty bound to keep it for himself. In answer to this it may be said that Christ, though possessing a human nature, was yet a divine person, and as such was not subject to the law in its federal aspect, the law as the condition of life in the covenant of works. As the last Adam, however, he took the place of the first. The first Adam was by nature under the law of God, and the keeping of it as such gave him no claim to a reward. It was only when God graciously entered into a covenant with him and promised him life in the way of obedience, that the keeping of the law was made the condition of obtaining eternal life for himself and for his descendants. And when Christ voluntarily entered the federal relationship as the last Adam, the keeping of the law naturally acquired the same significance for him and for those whom the Father had given him. 2. God demands, or can demand, only one of two things of the sinner, either obedience to the law, or subjection to the penalty, but not both. If the law is obeyed, the penalty cannot be inflicted, and if the penalty is borne, nothing further can be demanded. There is some confusion here, however, which results in misunderstanding. This either, or, apply to the case of Adam before the fall, but cease to apply the moment he sinned and thus entered the penal relationship of the law. God continued to demand obedience of man, but in addition to that required of him that he pay the penalty for past transgression. Meeting this double requirement was the only way of life after sin entered the world. If Christ had merely obeyed the law and had not also paid the penalty, he would not have won a title to eternal life for sinners, and if he had merely paid the penalty, without meeting the original demands of the law, he would have left man in the position of Adam before the fall, still confronted with the task of obtaining eternal life in the way of obedience. By his active obedience, however, he carried his people beyond that point and gave them a claim to everlasting life b. The passive obedience of Christ. Christ as mediator also entered the penal relation to the law, in order to pay the penalty in our stead. His passive obedience consisted in his paying the penalty of sin by his sufferings and death, and thus discharging the debt of all his people. The sufferings of Christ, which have already been described, did not come upon him accidentally, nor as the result of purely natural circumstances. They were judicially laid upon him as our representative, and were therefore really penal sufferings. The redemptive value of these sufferings results from the following facts, they were borne by a divine person who, only in virtue of his deity, could bear the penalty through to the end and thus obtain freedom from it. In view of the infinite value of the person who undertook to pay the price and to bear the curse, they satisfied the justice of God essentially and intensively. They were strictly moral sufferings because Christ took them upon himself voluntarily, and was perfectly innocent and holy in bearing them. The passive obedience of Christ stands out prominently in such passages as the following, Isaiah 53 verse 6, Romans 4 verse 25, Ipet 2 24, 3 18, 1 John 2 verse 2, while his active obedience is taught in such passages at Matt, 3 15, 5 colon 17 18, John 15 verse 10. Galatians 4 verses 4 and 5, Hebrews 10 verses 7 to 9, in connection with the passages which teach us that Christ is our righteousness, Romans 10 verse 4, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Phil 3 colon 9, and that he secured for us eternal life, the adoption of sons, and an eternal inheritance, Galatians 3 verses 13 and 14, 4 colon 4, 5. Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 12, 5 colon 25-27. Arminians are willing to admit that Christ, by his passive obedience merited for us the forgiveness of sins, but refuse to grant that he also merited for us positive acceptance with God, the adoption of children, and everlasting life. b. Objections to the satisfaction or penal substitutionary doctrine of the atonement. There are many circles in which this doctrine of the atonement is not popular. There always has been opposition to it, and in our day the opposition is particularly strong. The main objections are the following. 1. Such an atonement was entirely unnecessary. 
Some hold that such an atonement was entirely unnecessary, either because sin is not guilt and therefore does not call for an atonement, or because there can be no obstacle to the free forgiveness of sin in God, who is our Heavenly Father and is essentially a God of love. If a man can, and often does, forgive the penitent without demanding and receiving satisfaction, God, our perfect exemplar, surely can and will do this. This is the common objection of all those who advocate a purely subjective theory of the atonement. It may be answered, however, that the Bible certainly teaches us to regard sin as guilt, and because it is guilt, it makes man subject to the wrath of God and renders him liable to divine punishment. Moreover, the idea of a universal fatherhood of God, in virtue of which he loves all men with a redemptive love, is entirely foreign to Scripture. And if God is a father, he is also a judge, if he is a God of love, he is also a God of justice and holiness. There is no one attribute in God which dominates and determines the expression of all the other divine perfections. And, finally, it should not be forgotten that what man can do as a private as a individual, the... he is not always able to do when acting in the capacity of a judge. 2. Such an atonement would derogate from the character of God. Closely connected with the preceding objection is that which holds that such an atonement would derogate from the character of God from his justice, because he punishes the innocent for the guilty, from his love, because he acts as a stern, severe, and relentless being, who demands blood to appease his wrath, and from his pardoning grace, since he demands payment before he can or will forgive. But Christ voluntarily took the place of sinners, so that this substitution involved no injustice on the part of God. If God had been actuated by strict justice only, and not by compassionate love and mercy as well, he would have left the sinner to perish in his sin. Moreover, it is entirely incorrect to say that, according to the satisfaction doctrine of the atonement, the love and the pardoning grace of God could not flow forth until satisfaction was rendered, because God himself provided the ransom, and by giving his Son already gave evidence of his infinite love and pardoning grace. His love precedes even the repentance of sinners and calls this into action. 3. Such an atonement assumes an impossible transfer of wrath. It is pointed out that this doctrine of the atonement holds that God transferred his wrath against the sinner to the mediator, which is unthinkable, and that he also transferred the punishment of the sinner to Christ, which is manifestly illegal. In answer to this it may be said, however, that the wrath of God does not partake of the nature of personal vindictiveness, such as we witness among men, and which they would find it hard to transfer from the object of their hatred to a perfectly innocent person. It is God's holy displeasure against sin, a displeasure to which the sinner is also exposed as long as the guilt of sin is not removed. It is also quite natural that, when the guilt of sin as liability to punishment was transferred to Jesus Christ, the wrath of God against sin was similarly transferred. Moreover, it cannot be said that the transfer of the punishment to Christ was manifestly illegal, because, as a matter of fact, he identified himself with his people. He made satisfaction as the responsible head of a community for those who in union with him constituted one legal corporate body. This responsible union was constituted, says Hodge, a, by his own voluntary assumption of the legal responsibilities of his people, b, by the recognition of his sponsorship by God, and c, by his assumption of our nature. 4. Such an atonement is not taught in the Gospels. Some are of the opinion that the Bible teaches no vicarious atonement or, if the Bible does, the Gospels certainly do not. And after all, it is what Jesus taught, and not what Paul said, that counts. We need not enter upon a lengthy discussion of this matter, since we have already shown that there is abundant proof for a vicarious atonement in Scripture. It is true that it does not stand out so clearly in the teachings of the Gospels as in those of the Epistles, but this is due to the fact, to express it in the words of Crawford that the purpose of our Lord's personal ministry in his life and death were not so much the full preaching of the atonement, as the full accomplishment of the atonement in order to the preaching of it. The Atonement, page 385. Yet even the Gospels contain sufficient evidence for it, Matt, 2028, John 1 verse 29, 3 verse 16, 10 verse 11, 15 verse 13, Matt, 26 colon 27, John 6 verse 51. 5. Such a doctrine is immoral and injurious. It is also claimed that this view of the atonement is immoral and injurious in its practical tendency. It is said to undermine the authority of the moral law, and to weaken, if not destroy, the force of our obligations and inducements to personal holiness.
this objection was already made to the doctrine of free grace in the days of Paul. The charge is not true, however, for this theory more than any other upholds the majesty of the law, and in no way minimizes the obligation of the redeemed sinner to render full obedience to the law. On the contrary, it offers several incentives to personal holiness, by emphasizing the exceeding sinfulness of sin, by displaying the unspeakable love of God and of Jesus Christ, and by the assurance of divine aid in the struggle of life, and of the acceptance of our imperfect services in Christ.